Yes, I think uh, I think we can start. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Pierluigi Mancarelli. I'm Chair Professor of Electro Power Systems here at University of Melbourne. I'm also Program Leader for Energy Systems in the Melbourne Energy Institute that is uh, hosting today this talk. Uh, so uh, thanks everyone here you know, for joining us our talk today, particularly Professor uh, Joisa Milanovic from the University of Manchester. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that today we gather on the lands of the Wurundjeri, Wurundjeri and Bumwurrung people. We've been custodians of this land for thousands of years. We acknowledge and pay our respects to our elders past and present. Please welcome to our online audience. And if you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A box on Zoom uh, as we go. And then I'll try to, to monitor all questions. Uh, I'll also like to um, remind everyone before we start that coming to the end of the year, we're looking forward to the MEI Symposium 2022. As you may know, uh, this is the Melbourne GCU major annual event. Um, I invite you to register using the QR code uh, on the slide or for people here in the room on, on the posters that you see over there. Uh, and of, of course, and I hope we can continue all discussions about energy systems uh, at, the, at the symposium. Uh, now, let me introduce our speaker of today, uh, Professor Jovic Milanovic from the uh, University of Manchester, where he's Professor of Electro Power Engineering and uh, uh, Deputy Head and from January uh, Head of the Department of Electro and Electronic Engineering uh, at the University of Manchester, indeed. He's also visiting professor at the Novi Sad and the University of Belgrade in Serbia, and as well as visiting professor here at the University of Melbourne uh, over the past uh, month, pretty much. Uh, professor Milanovic holds an engineering degree and master of science from the University of Belgrade in Yugoslavia, a PhD from the University of Newcastle in Australia, and a science and doctorate from the University of Manchester in the UK. He has vast experience in research industry and is a consult consultant advisory board member for various committees and international companies. Uh, importantly, I would like to add, uh, he's also editor-in-chief of the uh, Triple Transaction Power Systems, is the most prestigious journal in power systems, as you, as you may know. So in today's lecture, Professor Milanovic will speak to the question, what will net zero networks look like and how will they operate? Uh, he will introduce characteristics and challenges of distribution network environments now and into the future. And somehow uh, I believe it's going to provide a little bit of a different perspective related to what we usually see, uh, including uh, power, quality, uh, power quality aspects. Uh, now, thanks again for joining us. And now uh, over to you, Yoritza. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Macarella. Thank you, Perluigi. I hope uh, people online can hear and see me. I know that people in the room can see me because I can see them, so that's easy. So today uh, for uh, next uh, 40 minutes or so, I will be talking about various things and I'll combine along the way two areas which are not usually combined, which is um, power system, dynamics and demand side management at one hand and power quality on the other. This is to a large extent unusual combination, but I've done that uh, all my life doing unusual things in research. So I'll try to give you a perspective on how these things work together and why they should be working together. So the talk today will very briefly go through some characteristics of future systems that we are already seeing, even though they are future, or that we will see more and more uh, in years to come. Summarize some of the challenges, uh, show you some of the examples of the approach to resolving these challenges, or at least some of them. And then I'll briefly talk to uh, more down to earth stuff, which is how real world, how the industry is preparing to handle these challenges in the UK. So the first thing about the, the system uh, with the emphasis on, on distribution networks in particular, uh, market forces are all around us. And this is the novelty that we have in, in um, uh, it started actually, and it's going to be more and more present in years to come is the introduction or more strong or stronger introduction of market forces in distribution networks. The other thing that everyone is aware of is the proliferation of new types of generation 
in particular wind and solar, which is different from the one here at the moment because its production depends on the forces of nature. Depending what the weather is, what the climate is, different parts of the world, we may have different production from those generators. And they are also very dependent on time. So, for example, solar cannot work overnight. That's why we have some other issues associated with operation of these type of generators. The other thing is all of them require some storage to provide for energy when they are not in operation. So that makes the system altogether much more complex. Uh, the other thing which is happening in distribution networks in particular, I, I, I uh, kind of blocked a little bit the changes that, that are coming from transmission network because I want to focus on distribution networks care. The other thing is what happens at a low voltage level? Well, the loads are. Now, loads, loads have always been around. They always have been uncertain. But now we have different types of load. We have more and more loads connected to power electronic interfaces, including heat pumps, including high voltage, um, not high voltage, sorry, um, uh, heat ventilation and air conditioning uh, devices, and including, probably most notably, electric vehicles, which are a specific in, 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 um, in the fact that they are changing their operation with time and space, because they can move. So one day they can, one move, one, well, at some time, some hour, they can be at one location, a few hours later, they can be in a different location. And because of, because of the nature, how they operate, they may be either charging their batteries, which means they behave as a load, or discharging them when vehicle to grid technology becomes much more prevalent, uh, they become generators. So not only that they can operate differently from one hour to the next, they can do that at different locations, and they can behave both as a load and as a generation. The other thing which is uh, happening is more impetus given to integration of different systems, integration of electricity, gas, heat, network, transport, putting them all together and trying to make efficient energy system, not only energy, but a efficient system that makes our lives easier. So imagine if you are building a new city, as some countries are doing in a very short period of, of time, uh, you have to design infrastructure for heating, cooling, transport, communications, electricity supply, and so on. If you do that all independently, as we have done in the past, you will end up digging the roads every few months. So in order to avoid that, you would be probably better off you can design a system from the start as optimal in terms of efficiency and operation. So this calls for integrated look into a problem of energy supply, whether it's electrical, heat, gas, water, transport, communication system, and so on. The other thing which is particularly, specific, uh, particularly uh, characteristic for distribution network we have customers. Distribution network has many individual customers, many people, depending on electricity supply, and they have to look after them. They have to ensure that they have right people in place to provide services to those customers. Right people in terms of skills, technical skills, but also, which is a very big thing in the United Kingdom at the moment, right people representing community that they serve. Now, representing community that serve means various things, means, means uh, cultural, ethnic, gender, etc. background. And this is a very, very big thing in the UK at the moment. And then the other thing, very, very important, is ensuring that no one in this chain of supply is left behind. So how do we look after people who are less fortunate? less fortunate financially or health-wise. So this is a group of people that is of particular concern for all energy and other companies, not only for electricity distribution suppliers and, and, and uh, operators. So this is another area where distribution networks are particularly looking into uh, at the moment. Now, this development of system that, we've, that I've tried to briefly summarize here in order to, to to, to spare some time for some other more interesting stuff, I suppose, uh, is clearly leading to a network which has much more power electronics devices in it. Now, power electronics are known to be 
not so friendly as the customers for electricity networks because they are typically operating in a nonlinear fashion, so they generate harmonics. So they are causing or might cause problems to the network at one hand. On the other hand, they are typically the most sensitive loads in the network that are first to trip if something goes wrong in the network. So we have devices which are multiplying, which are both the most pollutant and most affected by the service network. So this is something which tells us that the new network will not be short of harmonics in particular, no devices affected by harmonics. I picked up harmonics because power electronic devices are particularly known for generating harmonics at one hand, as I said, but this is probably the, the, their strongest characteristic. The other thing, just a, a slight uh, deviation from topic, power, power uh, electronic devices, inverters, are most sensitive not because of harmonics, but because they are most sensitive to voltage drops. So if the voltage drops for whatever reason, the network, they're the first one to get disconnected. So they are very sensitive to voltage variations at one hand and very unfriendly in terms of generating harmonics. This is not the case for all power electronic devices, clearly. Uh, not the case for modern ones as taken specific, uh, individually. But when you talk about multitude of those devices in, uh, we are still yet to learn how that will work together. And I'll show some examples later on. So now putting all this together, there are few areas which I singled out as very important or, or characteristic for the networks that we are going to be working within. One is data, reliance on more monitoring, collecting the data, and you are all aware, I, I've just learned while I was here in Australia for the last two months, three months, well, two months, here, and I was here for a month, and I was uh, one month in, in Queensland as a, a visiting professor at the University of, of Queensland in Brisbane. So is the mandatory requirement that everyone has smart meter? So when you have a smart meter in the home, uh, the communication, the type of information it collects and sends is multiplying by millions. Now, there are devices in addition to smart meters at other parts of the network, which are also capable of bi-directional communication, so receiving information and sending information. So this amount of data that we have is making it impossible for us to analyze them as it did in the past. So we need to look into ways of how these data can be processed efficiently and fast to get the right information from them. The other thing is, which is another big thing at the moment, collecting information by one company or at one side, say distribution network, is fine. Collecting the data from the transmission network side is also fine. But these two networks are not independent. They have to exchange the data. They have to exchange, in this particular case, the data related to operation of their parts of the network. But then this is something that hasn't been done in the past, or at least not at the level which is required to operate this much more complex network at the moment. So a lot of work is going on at the moment around the world in not only collaboration between transmission and distribution networks. The first thing is to enable data sharing and data security and privacy when you do that. The other thing is apart from data, the other big problem is modeling. Now modeling of different parts of the network, of the distribution network in particular, is something that has been around for many, many years. But these types of generators and loads that we have at the moment and different levels of, or different types of energy vectors that we are considering were not around all the time, or at least there was no requirement to do it together. So how do you model devices which are uncertain, which have stochastic behavior, which have different behavior when exposed to disturbance? This is another area which we have to look uh, very, very closely. The other topic, which is particularly important for distribution networks is power quality. Uh, this is something which we've always been kind of concerned about because you know, uh, the definition of power system is that it should deliver among the other things, energy to end users of a sufficient and acceptable quality. Now, how do you ensure 
that the power quality you are delivering from a, such a complex network, which has so many various devices operating in different way, with different intermittency, with different uh, nonlinearity, how can you make sure that you don't have problems with them? Uh, the issue I mentioned power quality here is that people who look into, say, load growth and um, hosting capacity, they typically look from one angle. People who look at the power quality issues, they look at it from their angle. So there is very few, well, I am not aware of any, maybe some people are, studies where these two things are taken into account together and look at as integral part of the network because network does not operate separately from the point of view of hosting capacity, voltage variation, and harmonics. All of this happens at the same time. And we tend to analyze that separately as different pockets. So modeling of devices which don't behave in a predictable way, the only way forward is do it in a probabilistic manner. Now, one thing is you collect the data, you increase observability of the network, so what's going on there. You model different devices in the network, so you, you know how to study them, how to run simulations of whatever type you want to. But then all is for the purpose of making sure that network operates safely, reliably, and stably. Because with stability also becomes an issue now in distribution networks because of the uh, renewable generation connected at low voltage levels. So the issue of controlling such a network is becoming very, very pertinent. Distribution networks didn't have many issues with control in the past because they were passive. They were receiving electricity from the high voltage levels and passing it on to customers. Now we have many devices inside the network which can help or hinder the operation of the network. So you need to do something about it. You need to control them. That's why we started talking about the distribution system. Now, operators in some countries and operation in the United Kingdom. So DSO in the United Kingdom is translated as distribution system operation, not operator. Distribution network operator remains as it is. And distribution system operation is a service which is now separated as a special directorate within distribution network. And that distribution system operation tends to uh, procure services from third parties. But in order to be able to facilitate that, that's why I mentioned markets in the beginning, you have to provide a level playing field and to make sure that whatever happens, the control, the overall control of the network now with all different devices has to be efficient. That's why the control becomes an issue. And because we don't have as much money or we are not allowed, as you will see later on, by the regulators, which we are not allowed as before to just dig and put wires in the ground and put poles for overhead lines, they have to rely more and more on flexibility provision from other providers. Now, this means that if we don't have enough money to invest or we are not allowed to invest in infrastructure, we have to control network more efficiently. Now, controlling the network more efficiently, the network which is variable and whose operation changes from time to time requires for very fast control. Very fast control of uncertain performance means risk-based control. So you have to accept that something may go wrong. So this is particular challenge for distribution networks or distribution network operators because they haven't, they didn't have to do that in the past. This is something new for them. And they are, I wouldn't say concerned, but they are aware of the challenges that this is posing. And they are rapidly acquiring the knowledge and recruiting people that can handle these new challenges. Now, addressing these challenges, three of them, data modeling and control. It can be done, obviously, we've solved many other problems in the past, not only in electrical system, but in, in, in other areas of life. What is characteristic for all of them is, I'm not going to go through this in detail, is this type of people, type of skills that we need. The skills that are needed, and I mentioned that at one of the other talks that I gave here over the last month or so. Now, I suppose that most of the people in the room are 
of electrical engineering background, whatever specialty may be, maybe communications, maybe uh, power electronics, maybe power, power, and, um, power, um, power and energy. What I suspect in 20 years from now, many more people, if not majority in the room, will not be people with electrical engineering background because the skills that we need now to be able to handle the network are coming from different areas, communications, control, uh, data science, computer science, and so on. So now I'm going to show some examples of uh, how my group uh, at the University of Munster has been trying to attack this problem uh, over the years. Now, one of the things that I'm going to talk about, there are two things because I, I don't have uh, enough time for, for, for more than that. So there are, there are two areas. One is demand side management. Demand is something which became very um, um, important topic in, in recent years because by controlling demand, we can actually uh, utilize better available renewable energy. So the key point here is if there is a wind and sun at the moment, can we use it now? And when there isn't sun and wind, can we disconnect the load? So that means that we have to change the way how we've done it in the past. In the past, generation was following the load. When the load is up, we fire up generators to pick up the load. What we want to do now is depending on what generation does, we then engage demand. Now, one of the things to do that is to control demand. Now, controlling demand is one thing. Now, demand is electricity usage by group or groups of people or sectors. Typically, we classify demand in different classes like domestic, industrial, commercial, urban, rural, agriculture, and so on. But that's not enough. If you want to make active control, you need to know more about demand. You need to go first to specify what is, which part of it is controllable, which part of the electricity users can be controlled and which cannot. Then among those controllable and uncontrollable, you have different devices. You have uh, water heaters, you have kettles, you have washing machines, fridges, air conditioning system, heat pumps, electric vehicles, and so on, lights. But not all of them can be switched on and off at will because we depend on them, people depend on them. You, you can't switch off the lights during the night, obviously, because you need, you need lights in, in the spaces where you work or live. The other thing is with that, knowing which can be connected or disconnected and knowing what types of devices we have, that again, doesn't solve the problem because fridge and washing machine will behave pretty similarly if the disturbance in the network happens. So we have to group them based on their physical behavior when exposed to disturbances, whether it's steady state or dynamic operation, they will affect the network differently depending on the way how they consume electricity. So in order to address that problem, I'll just show some illustrations. So this is example of classical subdivision of total demand into commercial, residential, um, industrial, and so on. Now, these are normalized curves, how these different classes of users are using electricity. When you stack it together, you actually see that during the day at any time in, within 24 hours, there is a different proportion of electricity used by different class of customers. Now, class of customers, as I said, it's not good enough because what we actually need to know is which devices, this is now one of these classes, domestic customs, so which devices are using electricity, for example, at this hour? And you can see subdivision of what type of devices are using. Now, with appliances, lights, cooking, or, or cooking and hot water, these are resistive loads. So again, that's not good enough. We need to know more. We need to know, we need to know what is physical property of these devices. So we have to do another categorization in, in, in terms of categories, how these devices will behave if exposed to the service, because this will affect the network operation after all. Now, not only do we need to know how they will uh, behave, they will behave differently, depending on what the mix at a particular time at the particular bus is. And I'll show you examples of that by what we've done with this. We try to just one second, I have to get out of here because we had some issues with 
uh, this one. So we've developed a, a, a um, we developed a tool that can forecast demand. I think it was one of the first ever demand in terms of categories, not in terms of how much power will be used tomorrow, real and reactive. Again, prediction of reactive power is much more difficult and hasn't been done before, but we went a step further and we used very sporadic information, as you will see here, only historical data on um, real and reactive power consumption at a bulk supply power station and historical weather to train the, the tool. And then using artificial neural networks, we were able to produce output, which forecasts how much real and reactive power will be consumed at any point in the future. We've, we have examples here for 30 minutes and 24 hours, but it can be shorter than that. Now, these uh, examples, why don't you see this? You don't see the slides, right? Strange. Sorry. Something went wrong. Stop share. Okay. So share the screen again. And this one. Yep. Yeah, so, sorry. So by knowing, as I said, P and Q information at the bus, some weather uh, performance in the past, we can train the tool based on artificial neural networks and forecast output in terms of what's going on. Which screen do you see? You see this screen. So why can't... Uh, yeah, I shared it from... I did exactly the same thing as I did before. So, uh, try that again. Just stop sharing. Oh. Stop share this one. Go back to the top. Stop share. So this should be this one. Share. No, it's not working. Let's try that again. It was working. Yeah. Earlier. Where are we? Share. Let's add this one. Is that the one? Yeah. Can you? That's not. Well, we can't, I can't share the right screen. See, I'm trying to, so we did it before. Marvels of modern technology. The sharing should come from this computer. Yeah, it's running from this one. Beg your pardon, everybody. Stop share. Yeah. And then so share screen. From this one. Try from PowerPoint. Yeah, share. share. Okay. No, it's not. See, it's not okay. changing the other screen. It's not this screen. What's that? 
Uh, try this one. Anyway, we'll just give it a try one more time. Unfortunately, uh, I'm going to search on here. Yeah, I'm sure that seems to be working. Can we progress to the next slide? Yes. Nope. That's not the application. Nope. Anyway, sorry about this. Uh, unfortunately, I can't show you. Um, next time i'll come again um stop share i'll find it no, 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 no. yeah it was the same day there are only three open so we'll go back here never mind as i said we'll do that next time i'll come again i promise just to show you these slides, I'll try to explain it, that you have to trust me that it actually is working. So we were somewhere here. Slide yeah, slideshow mode. Okay. Anyway, so we develop a tool for, as a part of, of European project, which actually forecasts real and reactive power in, um, in pretty much real time. It takes about four minutes of training, uh, five seconds to forecast real reactive power every 30 minutes in the future. And then another seven seconds, we can get the uh, subdivision of demand, not only in terms of controllable and uncontrollable load, but also in terms of different load categories, in terms of how this demand will respond. So altogether, within um, four minutes and 11 seconds, you can get updates. So if you can get updates for such a short period of time, that means you can you can run prediction of what is controllable or not within a time frame of five minutes. We didn't use it for five minutes. I know it's popular time scale here in, in Australia. Uh, we did it for 30 minutes, but we could do that. And then we tested and apply the algorithm on real network, uh, which is uh, in, in one of the European countries, to uh, validate whether we can actually first forecast real and then reactive power. And then 11 seconds later, all together to get the uh, subdivision of what is available for control. That was based purely on non-measurement approach. Then we thought, right, so we don't have any, any, no measurements at all, no live signals coming from any customer. Then we tried, okay, can we do something uh, if we do a little bit of measurement? And then if we have these smart meters and how many of them we need to be able to do this subdivision in controllable, uncontrollable, different categories, so we develop another tool relying on uh, data coming from uh, smart meters, uh, enhanced smart meters that can actually tell you what type of device is working at what time. And we try to get this subdivision in not only control and control, not uncontrolled, but also in terms of uh, load categories. And that thing uh, show that within, with only 5% of meters within a substation, you can get you can see these two figures. Uh, by naked eye, they are pretty much the same. You can't tell the difference between the two. One is 100% monitoring, and the other one is with only 5% monitoring. Uh, the errors are shown there. So once you get from 5% coverage, which is very, very little, imagine out of 100 customers, you, can, you need to monitor only 5% of them. 5% of, of that's one, what, 1 20th? 1 20th of, of 100 is how many? Five. So with five monitored customers, you get pretty good results. If you increase the number of monitored customers, it becomes even more accurate, but there was no need to do that for the purpose of predicting what the load composition will be. Now, why, is that, why does that matter? It matters because what you can see here is depending on what you connecting and disconnecting in different time due to demand side management, the composition at bulk supply points changes. And you have here different compositions before and after shifting a group of customers, depending which customers you shift. And you can see for uh, during the peak hours when you're reducing the load, how composition changes at that hour when you disconnect certain type of devices. So uh, this slide here, for example, if you look 
if you look there, do you see my cursor at all? Do you have a do you see red dot? Where is it? Anyway, so if you look this, if you shift only constant impedance loads, you can see the change in composition, which is totally different from what we had before. And that matters. That matters. This is for low load, because this is what happens. If you shift the load from one hour to the next, the, this is the voltage pattern and distribution that will change dramatically. So this is something that, well, we know that it will happen when you reduce the load, it will happen. But depending on what you disconnect and how much of it, your voltage situation during the peak hour or during the low hour, during the low load, can be very, very different. So it's not about reducing demand only. You have to watch what happens with other parameters in the network. And then we went a step further and tried to demonstrate, can we manipulate demand to follow or to uh, use as much as we can the renewable generation? So this is example. When we have uh, a generator that we want to use maximally so that we can want to manipulate demand so that the generation, the renewable generation, solar generation in particular, is used uh, to the max. Now, when doing that, one has to be aware that you can't change things instantaneously. There is time required for demand to reduce, finite time, it's not instantaneous, for demand to reduce and to increase. There is a question also, demand that you disconnected will have to come back. So you can't assume I've disconnected 20 gigawatts now, or 20 megawatts or 20 kilowatts, and they will stay disconnected for five hours. You can't do that. You have to reconnect them after some time. So your demand will come up because you are reconnecting those that you've disconnected two hours ago. So whatever you disconnect two hours later, it will not be in addition to what you disconnect two hours earlier. It will be some disconnection, but some will come back. So there is a load payback. And then again, there is a question of how much it is available to be disconnected. So we, we run some studies. And what I want to show you here is trying to take into account these realistic constraints, what we actually can do with demand side management. So you, have, you can see here that there, are, there is a reduction. Blue line is, um, uh, blue dashed line is the demand during the 24 hours without doing any uh, control, any disconnection or connection. And the black line is after applying demand side management with constraints that loads disconnected three hours ago have to be connected and depending on what type load you are disconnecting. So you can see that we did vary the demand in different hours, but not much. Now, if we change the load payback policy, if we say, okay, disconnected load can stay longer. So what happens? We have bigger reduction in, the, in demand. So we are achieving better the control of demand in terms of reducing or increasing demand when we want to do that. However, the other part of the, of the, of the equation, the, the constraint we have in the network is performing badly. So voltage, potential voltage stability becomes endangered because we are reducing the stability margin. So we can't actually disconnect as much as we wanted because we are endangering other aspects of network operation. And this is example, a uh, further example of how before and after this connection, you have change in composition and also how the profile in the network varies, which is something which you have to be aware of. So if you look here, the, 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 the dotted line is how much we can disconnect and the black line is how much we actually could disconnect because we can't disconnect everything that's available. There are some constraints. Now, the other aspect I want to touch briefly on uh, is power quality. Now, we developed there an index to account for more than one power quality aspect at the same time because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a system operation. So harmonics, unbalance, uh, voltage sags, et cetera, they all come together. So we developed some indices with, with, with colleagues from different, uh, from, from uh, University of Dresden in, in, um, in Germany. There are two different indices, different way. We, we, we've done it independently from each other. So we developed the, the same, we solved the same problem uh, in a different way. And we were able to map network performance per week with respect to different 
aspects, uh, RMS, voltage variation, total harmonic distortion, unbalance, uh, PLT, which is a measure of flicker in the network, and different individual harmonics. And if you look at these two, they are scaled uh, to uh, using the same scale. So they are different. The colors of these charts are different. This is over a period of 60 weeks. Same phenomena, and the index, indices that we developed are given at the top. So you can see the colors are different, but they are indicating the same performance. So we use that later on. This is not going to work now, I'm afraid. To... Uh, to improve the quality in the whole network. And if it works, let's see if it works. I, I'll just give it a try very briefly. Uh, might or might not. Uh, before you came into the room, we tested it and it did work. Now it, uh, there is some issue here. Why it doesn't, but um, yeah, exactly, exactly. You see the screen, okay? If I sh yes. go into presentation mode, you get it. You do, good. So this is assumption that network has nonlinear loads. Some are fixed, some are electric vehicles. There are photovoltaics, there are micro, it's a, it's a mixture of the future network. So what happens, what we wanted to do is, yeah, doesn't work, good, Never mind. Next time, as I said, I'm sorry about this. I really am, but I can't do anything about it. I can't do anything about it. I, I honestly spent many hours during the night to make it work, and it works on my computer, but somehow I can't, I can't do it here. Anyway, the point is, as the load changes, these heat maps show during the year, the whole year, as the composition of the load in the network changes, how overall power quality in the network varies. The red areas are bad and the green areas are good. So the first graph was supposed to change in time. You would have seen it's alive and it's animation. So the first one is the power quality performance, global power quality performance in the network without any mitigation. The second slide shows what happens if you apply control measures, both by installing specific devices and by doing some network interventions. Um, ungrounding the cables, fixing transformers, etc., replacing transformers, and so on. And the third one is when we take into account money, how much this cost. When the power quality mitigation is based on techno-economic assessment, and you would see that you can't, unfortunately, you have to trust me on that. Uh, the the performance of the network during the year varies much. Uh, varies very much depending on what solution you are applying. So I have to go back to the original slide. Uh, just a second, public lecture. The most recent stuff that we've done in this is the, what is now? Try sharing screen again, please. Um, share. This, this is the only one. Share. Right. Okay. So this is the one which uh, looks into the network with electric vehicles, nonlinear load, heat pumps, for example, and other um, LED lighting, um, air conditioning systems, and photovoltaics. So what we've done, we developed methodology to predict uh, how the harmonic and unbalanced, in particular in this study, in the network will change depending on the proliferation of the electric vehicles, types of charging, whether you charge them controllably or uncontrollably, and percentage of electric vehicles, and also present of uh, photovoltaics. So what you can see here is dependence on of total harmonic distortion and third harmonic in the network, depending on what type of charging we are using, whether the limit, how many clients in the network during 160 weeks that we tested this for. 160 weeks is what, five years, right? No. Three years, three years and a half. So over the period of three years, we had some data. So we tested how 
the uh, harmonics in the network will vary over 160 weeks depending on types of charging, then depending on the um, location of the electric vehicles, then depending on percentage of electrical penetration. You can see different values. We don't have time to discuss the, the fact, but these are the, the studies that we, are, the, that we are running at the moment. And then we looked into what happens if in this network with a lot of nonlinear loads, different percentage of penetration of electric vehicles, different modes of charging of electric vehicles and different locations of electric vehicles, how the situation will change if you have on top of that photovoltaics. What happens, uh, the, the summary is with photovoltaics, the problems go down. The problems will go, go down because of the nature of harmonics injected by photovoltaics, which are opposite from the harmonics injected by electric vehicles. So they are phase uh, opposite. So they, they actually attenuate each other. And this is example of unbalance. You can see uh, different, different levels of unbalance depending where the electric uh, vehicles are. Uh, this is again the level depending on, on, on type of charging, the effect on unbalance depending on, on what type of charging we're using. And this is a bigger network with about 600 buses, which is THD and unbalanced together. So different colors indicate different level of intensity of the problem. Finally, coming back to these are the things that we can see in real world. Now, how the real world is handling this. In the UK, over the last five years, there have been intense preparations for new pricing regime, which starts on the 1st of April next year. And this is known as REO, stands for revenue, it is a sum or compilation or a union of incentives, innovation, and outputs. So this process involved uh, for gas and transmission and electricity transmission networks that was finished last year and fund distribution network is, is finishing now. So all distribution networks in the UK were involved in that. And there are a lot of checks and balances put in place to make sure that this is done properly. This is a timeline of the process. As you can see, the first draft of the business plan was submitted uh, a year and a half ago. And in two days, the final decision of the regulator will be made whether whatever distribution companies proposed is going to happen or not. There were some uh, uh, um, stages along the way. So comments on draft business plan by, by the regulator and other groups. There were groups who were appointed to look after that uh, at the side of the regulator and the start of individual companies. So all these groups were required to guide distribution companies in preparing, same was for transmission, in preparing business, business plans. And the, the, they were providing comments. They were independent from the company and from the regulator. Uh, and they were feeding information to regulator independently. And based on these checks and balances, if you like, the final determination by the regulator will be published how or to what extent the proposed business plans by distribution companies will be accepted. The key aspects of all the business plans for all six uh, licensees are listed here. One is net zero. So this is the first thing. So how we can uh, account for uncertainty related to load related network investment now this is one thing there's here is that they they um, the, the point is that uh, because everything is uncertain the regulator doesn't allow companies to spend money now but they want them to put the money aside and to pick relevant amount from that pot when the things become more certain now the other thing is uh whole system and distribution system operation it's been realized that Africa is much more active, the thing that I was talking in the beginning, and that much more reliance has to be put on flexibility providers, flexibility resources, which will probably come from third parties, much higher reliance on data. So a lot of effort was put, put in developing, mm, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't like to be quoted on this, on artificial intelligence tools, however, there is a lot of effort put in trying to understand the data coming uh, from different devices in the network. And one is 
how do you balance participation of distribution network operator in terms of re replacing the assets and third party providers? So th that's why the market is proliferating in distribution uh, network uh, operation space to make this fair participation from all sides. So if it is cheaper to subcontract someone to provide flexibility, uh, then you do that. You just don't dig and put a cable in, in the ground. The other is cost. Uh, expenditure plans are scrutinized very much to deliver net zero at minimum cost. And then equally important are technical performance, which is reliability and resilience, environmental performance, whether they are going to be environmentally friendly, and vulnerability. Do we look after customers? Uh, I'm not saying that each of these or any of these is more important than the other. Each of those, uh, giving in, in black font, are uh, bold black, are equally scrutinized by all these groups, by uh, regulator, by their independent group, by independent groups of individual distribution companies. And they all were coming back to distribution networks and asking them to provide uh, further explanations or to do it better if need be. One thing that I want to finish up with is in practically every business plan submitted, the sentence in yellow is very, very prominent. To explain it, all of them are stating they will do things in the next five years at lower cost to customers than in previous five and deliver more benefits. So there is no, this was before current energy crisis. There was a push from the regulator, deliver more than, than what you delivered in the past five years for less money to the customer. And this is how they were assessed. As you can see, none of them is green. This was based on um, a report published in February this year after the, the final business plans were submitted. And after this came this uh, public hearing when public was asked what they think about it and then uh, draft determination, which is the initial comments by the regulator and the final determinations are coming in two days time. This is how six licensees were assessed in terms of different aspects looked at by these uh, controlling groups. None of them is green, none of them is yellow. So they found the, the controlling bodies and the re this is the regulator's assessment. They found that each of them is doing some things right and some things not so well. So the future, as I said, instead of the conclusion, I don't have a, a solution. I don't think anybody has. The thing is that the problems that we are facing are requiring much closer collaboration of different parties involved, which are listed here. But one thing that I repeated several times while in Australia, both in September and, and here in, in, uh, in September in Brisbane, in Queensland, and now in Victoria, is the one that the word shown in italics, training. There is a level of misunderstanding between people like me, Professor Mancarella, Professor Ochoa, sitting or standing on this side of the lectern and people in the audience, not you, not you. In terms of terminology that we are using, we need to do some education of the audience in terms of the language and dictionary that we are using so that we can start speaking common language. And then we can address the problems that we've discussed today. Uh, that was the issue with power quality 20 years ago. A lot of courses were organized around the world, including here in Australia, for people to be brought to the same level of understanding of definitions of the problems. And then we start to address the problems and solve many of them. I think that we are at the stage now in uh, when we talk about transformation of distribution network or, or transformation of energy system, where we still where we need to go back 
and do some education of practicing engineers because they haven't been, I wasn't taught this when I was a student a zillion years ago, nor are the current students. So we have to kind of bring people up to the same level before starting to address the problems. I'm very sorry for not being able to show you these fancy slides with the all jumping and, and, and screaming images, but this is the risk of using modern technology. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jovica. I think I have seen almost all your presentations. I'm, I'm still learning a lot, so thanks. Uh, it thanks is so very much. difficult to stay original after this is my 12th talk in Melbourne in um, less than three weeks. It's very difficult to have 12 very different presentations by a same person. Uh, it was great. Thank you. And uh, I would like to ask the audience now for questions. I'm sure there will be also questions. Glenn, please. Uh, wait a second so they can hear also. I'll stay here so that people can see me. I forgot myself and moved there so I can see you and then they couldn't see me. So I'll, I'll go back behind the lectern and here I am. Uh, thank you very much for presenting again. Um, my question is relating to your uh, statement that Rio is asking the distributors to put aside money. Yes. As they don't know what to do, if you like, just yet. They haven't decided yet. And I'm curious because uh, you, you've sort of presented a case that shows that uh, distributed control of load is uh, one of the options for yes. uh, improving grid uh, management. Uh, and um, the, the technology is there to do that. Why wouldn't there be money being allocated to setting up control capability at this stage, uh, just to focus on that particular area of control? Um. This is recorded. This is being recorded. Uh, so the investment, projected investment by companies and required funds to do everything that they thought they should be doing were too high. A lot of money. And the bills to the end users were not low enough. So in order to manage the bills, in order to, for us to pay less in next five years than previous five years, we have to address the issue of the cost to the end user. The way to address it is to say, look, all what you've said is correct based on your forecast of load growth and type of load that will grow, which obviously led to required, requiring new investments in new technologies, new devices, and so on. However, you don't know whether it is going to happen or not. Example, there is a national, as same as in Australia, national um, scenarios, different scenarios, how things may evolve over the years. These national scenarios are called national because they are global. They take care of the whole country. But individual companies operate individual parts of the country and they have specific region requirements. So prediction is that nationally, electric vehicles will go through the roof, not, not literally. Heat pumps, not so much. I'm talking about United Kingdom. One of the uh, electricity company that I was associated with has opposite prediction based on local knowledge, on knowledge of their customers. In their case, electric vehicles will not be that high, but heat pumps will be very, very high. The, the, the proliferation of heat pumps in the next five years. Now for that, they needed additional investment, but they are not actually sure whether it's going to happen or not. So what the regulator said, look guys, because you don't know what actually will happen in five years, let, well, in two years, let alone five years, why don't we focus now on things that we are more certain about and those that we are not, all the investment associated with those things that we are less certain of, we'll put it, we are not taking it from you. We are putting it in a separate account. And you can draw from it when you become more certain about what will happen next. You will draw from the account subject to our approval. So you will have to, as we do for budget <laughs> in any walk of life. So it's your money, but you have to justify why you need it. So this justification and withdrawal of the money from the pocket 
which is up, they didn't reduce the total amount of money that companies asked. They just separate in, in, two, in two accounts, one that you can use now and one subject to future development. So this is what, what this uncertainty mechanism did. Because of the uncertainties and because the national thing has to be taken into account to have a, a level playing field rather than regional. So regional characteristics were slightly um, put aside, even though companies were encouraged when they developed their own plans to pay attention to regional characteristics. But at the end, uh, nobody was aware that these regional characteristics are very different and it was very difficult to, to even them up. So this is the reason for putting some money aside. Thank you. Nando, please. Thanks, Thanks Jovica, for the presentation. I just like this discussion because on one hand, you can think of um, the fact that uh, they are trying to cater for uncertainty by focusing on what they know. Yeah. But at the same time, what they are making it is a very short-sighted decision. Because when we talk about investment on transformers, conductors, the actual infrastructure that we need you know, to move the electrons uh, is something that takes years and something that will have a life of 20, 30 years, yeah. depending on the companies. So if we plan always you know, for the next two years, well, my expectation is that the cost is going to go through the roof in the long run, because of course, in the short term, we're going to go for more fancy mechanisms when actually we should compare you know, with the traditional investment of transformers and normal assets which should be also part of the discussion. What are your views there? I absolutely agree with you. All groups that were in charge of scrutinizing development of business plans for six companies, including the one on the side of the regulator, were not particularly enthused by the decision of the regulator to do what they've done. All groups said that there is no guarantee that when you come later, that the cost that you are going, the money they're going to, to, to ask later will be less than what it would have been now. How can ensure that you are actually not going to increase these bills in two years time because all of a sudden because of these uncertainties, oh, I need more money. So customers may actually not be better off. But we were overrun. So I agree, it's not, it, there are a lot of uh, issues involved in making such a decision. Uh, they are, they, different checks and balances are put in place to try to ensure that it doesn't happen, that the bills don't go up. But many of the issues have been, I, I, I can't say that it, it, it is not the case. They have not been sidelined, but the net zero aspect which was very prominent in all distribution network plans is still prominent. I wouldn't say very because between January last year and August this year, a lot of things happened, which are kind of putting different perspective on the issues. Energy prices are going up. People don't have enough money. You can't focus on investing in say, replacing your, one of the, one of the things that all companies said, we are going to replace our, our uh, fleet of cars and, 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 and utilities, utility vehicles over next two years. Pretty much, well, older and newer ones, and we are going to buy electric vehicles. That thing now becomes, or comes under, additional scrutiny. Is it really the time now that I'm going to replace all trucks and, and, and cars to, for, for the environmental purposes when people don't have money to, to, uh, to buy food? Another thing is some people said we need to protect the places of natural beauty. So we are going to underground all the overhead wires you two know and many other people probably lake district is a fantastic place in in the north west of england and some people were complaining look we don't want to see these cables uh, overhead lines going through a such a beautiful um, um, terrain so can we underground them and the distribution companies say, yeah we, we can do that obviously because there is a cost attached to it but we can do that now is that now priority 
when we have all other problems. So things like that have been uh, reshaped over the last few months. And I am eagerly looking forward to see what the final decision will be because I, I will have sight of it probably a day or two before it's, it's published, it's, it's made public, not I only, but people involved in this process. And I really want to see how far or how much the um, recommendations made on the 29th of June by Ofgem in terms of what, what's on, what's off, how much they changed in the space of six months between June and November this year because of the, let's call it, world situation. Thanks, Joyce. Michael, do you have a question or comment? A quick question. Thank you. It's a wonderful talk. Uh, in the UK, correct me if I'm wrong, you, you have retailers like we do, yes. separate from the network owners, whereas in the US, yes, it's, yes, it's yes, different. Yes. So here, for example, there's a much greater confluence between retailers potentially taking control or installing and taking control of appliances in the house which may have nothing to do at all with network operations. For example, our equivalent of BT is uh, Telstra, and they have created an energy retailer as well. And you can imagine yeah. if they have a communications network and an energy retailer, there's a tremendous opportunity for them. Uh, what sort of complexities do retailers who have increasing access to controllable loads present to network operations? All this discussion about reducing customer bills in case of distribution network operators is related to their share of bill. Their share of bill for one company was 80 pounds per year compared to a few hundred altogether. So retailers plus them. Now, retailers are also regulated. Uh, telecommunications, Ofcom is called in, in, UK, in, in that kingdom. They are also regulated. How is that all balanced? I honestly don't know. I honestly don't know. Distribution network operators were only looked at, their costs were only looked at from the point of view of their part of bill and their business. And they were asked to reduce their cost, their share of bill, compared to what they had in the past. I don't know what happened with the others, but I suspect the similar requests by government regulators uh, were put to other participants. In I know that the thing was uh, with gas, because gas and transmission network regulation uh, finished a year earlier. So they went through the same process of trying to keep their share of bill lower. So if the gas network is pushed to keep their share of bill low, and if the distribution network and transmission network, so you already have electricity and gas forced together to go down. I would assume that the same thing was done with telecoms. I know for water as well. So it's a, I would say, coordinated approach, but to a large extent independent from each other. And I don't know how effective it will be at the end. It's possible. It is possible. I don't think it will be allowed, but I, 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 I mean, we always say the times that we live in are uncertain, but over the last two or three years, we had a very different uh, ball game to play, and we still feel the ripples of that, and then the energy crisis, crisis came, and, and other problems in the world so uh, we'll 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 sail through this but i have i don't i don't know i don't know how i mean we will but i don't know what what the right way uh, through it is thank you yes. i think uh, uh, let, let me let me get uh, like a question from online professor okay. david, professor david hill who wants to be physically here but <laughs> hopefully later so uh, the as, as you may know the australian uh, the national electricity market was suspended uh, a few months ago, and now there are discussions about introducing new markets, mm -hmm. capacity markets, mar markets for 
system services and all that. Uh, you mentioned distribution level markets. Yes. And uh, the possible um, hierarchy somehow of markets is replaced or might replace system control in some sense. So what's your opinion about how this will all work, the idea of having multiple hierarchical markets, uh, particularly with respect to security, reliability, and resilience? And uh, will some will somehow lower the bills or, or make things worse? Huh. Yeah, That's a big question. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, David. Very kind of you. <laughs> um, the business plans came and are kind of gone. So what's happening now? Uh, distributed companies are hiring consultants to help them answer the questions they say they will answer that they put in in business plans so there are people now out there looking into coordination between different markets uh, a, a new regulatory frameworks that would need to be put in place who gets precedence if any and no one has the answer I know for a few of those companies that are actually very actively involved in looking into that to find out what is the way forward. Uh, I don't think that the uh, regulator will ever allow for resilience and reliability and efficiency. Efficiency was a big thing. Re resilience, yes. Reliability, yes. But efficiency was a very, very big thing. So I don't think that they will allow for any of these three, if you like, technical attributes of network performance to decline. But I don't think that there is, at the moment, uh, a decision of how these markets will operate. There have been examples where distribution networks put a request for flexibility provision and offered, well, they offered compensation for the service and nobody applied. So clearly something was not right. The uh, uh, remuneration for the services to be provided was not adequate because nobody, nobody came forward. So that has to be looked at. Now there have been changes to that. So the, the, the different aspects uh, are looked at at the moment. Now, how is that going to actually work when all of them across the country, across the world, start to apply uh, diff and it won't be one market it will be different markets in different parts of the world now wh whether there will be a hierarchy or i have i have absolutely no idea i don't know whether anyone has but i definitely don't so i don't i don't know how to answer that i'm sorry david well, thank you but it was good good elaboration anyway thank you uh the place here thanks um so that was completely riveting and i'm an economist and not a power system engineer yeah, so know. i enjoyed it enormously but I, I just wanted to ask this question so there's a regulatory fiction and i think what you're saying is it is a complete fiction that in australia the regulation and indeed the network obligation stops at the meter and so the customer is and if i'm a large customer within no, known and agreed constraints but if i'm a small customer I am the king of my own castle. So I can put whatever appliances I want in my house, subject to them uh, you know, not amounting to more than the house's electric mm. system will bear. And nobody has any control over this. But what you've been talking about is, in fact, that veil, piercing that veil and saying, mm, your refrigerator not so much of a good thing right now yes uh, a lot of why i was mentioning all these different areas of uh, interest that we should be looking at including social science a lot of work is being commissioned by uh, electricity networks from social scientists to look into human behavior both from the point of view of planning and control both from the point of view of how do you how do i judge whether in five years or in three years 
In that corner over there of Melbourne, there will be increase of electric vehicles, but not in this one. Does that have to do anything with demographics, with the age, with uh, affluence, with uh, culture, ethnicity? Can I influence that part there by telling them, not in a derogative way, but telling them stories about uh, things that matters to them because they are of particular, they belong to a particular group, whether it's ethnic, uh, religious, whatever. And then some other group, I talk to them only in terms of money. And then the other group talk only in terms of saving the planet. It's an enormous amount of work that is going on there. Uh, and I think that we are trying to learn first how to account for what people have done and are doing and how we can make them do what might be good for them. This is a big symbiosis. It's, I think, that of all the areas, the most work at the moment is with social sciences, behavioral sciences, social scientists, behavioral scientists, and companies providing uh, consulting services in that area to understand human behavior. Example, that was done for obviously business plan development and people went uh, experts in human behavior and, and, and social surveys and uh, nothing to do with electricity, nothing. So they went to a particular part of the city, I'm taking just an example, and asked, so what do you think about net zero? Would you like to invest in this? In, in, so the, the part of the city which was not very affluent and of particular, uh, not, not different ethnic origin, just people who were not so affluent. And they said, look, I have a problem in making ends meet. I don't have money to buy food for children. Can we talk about that net zero stuff some other time? So no interest at all. There were people who were different group. They, they group people differently. There were people who were busy running their lives, running all around the place, had money, but didn't have time to think about it. Saying, look, I, don't, I really don't have time to think about that. Can we talk about it some other time? Not one person, a group of people. There were people who were older, more uh, affluent, not rich, but more affluent, who thought, okay, we should be giving back something. Uh, it's good for our children, grandchildren. And they were more susceptible to investing in things. But these people were in different parts of the city. Uh, what people are trying to understand now, how do you stimulate all these different groups to play the ball, if I can be uh, that bold? So how do you make them do things which eventually will be good for them as well, but they may not be able to see it at the moment. So this is, this is what, what many people are now doing, trying to, 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 to squeeze, not squeeze in, but to uh, make use of understanding us as people before offer, I mean, Amazon and other Google, they, they know how to do that. So we are trying to learn from them. Thank you, Yovisa. I think with this note, we can probably close the, the session and I would like to ask everyone to join me again, uh, showing appreciation for Professor Milanovic. It was a Thank you. fantastic lecture and uh, yeah, hopefully you'll come back soon. Thank you. I'll try to do and I, I, I do apologize for technology, but uh, if I wasn't an engineer, I would be more happy with it. But since I used to be an engineer, we are where we are. Thank you. Thank you.